Ladies and gentlemen, uh, quite a few thousand years ago, uh, Adam and Eve tried the fruit from the tree of knowledge. And as a result, we were expelled from paradise, and now we're uh, bearing the fruits of this decision. But you know, not being in the paradise still, a man is a very opportunistic animal. We've been using knowledge graphs over and over again to organize our knowledge of the world, to understand how it works. And uh, graphs are really, um, and knowledge trees are really congruent to our way of thinking as humans. So what you see here is a depiction of a very early attempt of using a knowledge graph to categorize our understanding of the world. This is Aristotle's knowledge graph as presented in the 13th century by, by Ramon Lull. And then fast forward a couple of centuries and you see uh, John Sowa's uh, use of Leibniz's methods to represent all the possible categories of knowledge and concepts Again, yet as another knowledge graph. So fast forward a couple of hundred years and we're here today. We're gonna to be speaking about how Morningstar Sustainalytics, the company that I represent, has been using knowledge graphs of the 21st century, basically, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and the graph structures in, in, in them to explore the world economy, to ask the hard questions about how corporations behave, and to help with the answers of these questions, to help the investors to make the world a better place. See, it was a very fast journey from Adam and Eve into today's day. So before we start talking about the, uh, the technical part of our conversation, I'll briefly tell you about the context of where we've used Knowledge Graph. My name is Arik Brutzan. I represent Morningstar Sustainalytics. Morningstar Sustainalytics is in the business of researching environmental, social, and governance, or ESG performance of the world economy. And our research and ratings is used by the key uh, investors, uh, uh, asset owners, and asset managers for their decision making to make the world a fairer and a better place to be. So we're in the business of um, not only looking into the world economy, but we're also in the business of advising those people whose decisions matter for the world economy. We're present in about 17 locations all, all over the world. We have more than 500 researchers. And our team, the digital innovation team that I represent, creates the tools that help us make our research both comprehensive and complete. ESG research, in a way, is something like being the corporate investigator of the world. We look into almost all the publicly traded companies, all the important private companies. We look into the funds. We assess them for how their ESG performance basically affects not only their profitability, but how it affects the society. We work for asset owners, asset managers, pension funds, and our areas of expertise allow us to advise investors how to better invest, how to be compliant, how to make sure that their investment doesn't serve the negative part of the corporate performance, but actually how their investment can change corporate performance for good. We have portfolio analytics services. We yeah, actually engage with the corporations and we help them to become better corporate citizens. And uh, we are, during this journey, during the journey of being corporate investigators of the world, we've built tools that allow us to comprehensively and completely look into the information field, in the, into the financial and economic information field. And this is where we apply knowledge graphs. We basically have used knowledge graphs in order to automate the processes of how corporates behave, both positively and negatively. The next speakers in, uh, today, Mihai Ilya, my colleague, is gonna be speaking and showing how we've used knowledge graphs to detect and understand how corporations might be involved in what we call controversies or incidents. We basically screen corporations for their negative involvement and we uh, create research and ratings that uh, reflects that involvement. And the speaker after Mihai Armen will be talking about the, how we've used knowledge graph to assess the positive part of corporate performance to basically look into their ESG impact and how to quantify it using knowledge graphs and how to translate it into actionable advice. With this, I'll give the floor to the real doers, please. Thank you. 
my name is Mihai Ilie, and I'm working as a machine learning engineer at Sustainalytics. In this project, we used graph neural networks to predict future incidents between companies. By an incident, we define a negative event in which uh, two or more companies are involved related uh, ESGs. Uh, suppose we have a data set in which companies are, are clustered into incidents. In this example, let's say we have the red companies' incidents, the green companies' incidents, and the blue companies' incidents. Some of these companies may be part of multiple incidents, and we are going to represent this by intersecting the clusters containing the common companies. But how can we have a better representation of these relationships between companies? We will connect with edges, each company is from the same incident clusters, and the companies that are part of uh, multiple clusters, that is, that are the intersection of multiple clusters, will act as connection points between different clusters. Doing this for all the data set, we will obtain a big connected graph in which companies are nodes and edges are incidents. That is, two companies are involved in an incident if the nodes that represent the companies have an edge between them. We will use graph neural network link prediction to predict future edges in the graph such that these future edges will represent future incidents. Uh, our data set consists of 637 edges, 527 nodes, and an average node degree of 1.2. Because each node is represented by a company, and we have for each company a text description, we will use the universal sentence encoder to embed that text description into a fixed-sized word embedding. So our final data set will be a connected graph which has undirected edges and has node, node feature size of size 512. For uh, graph link prediction, we will need to define the concept of transductive learning for dataset splitting. But before, we also need to define uh, two concepts of edges for link prediction. Usually, when doing link prediction, we will have message passing edges, which are used to pass the node embedding between neighbor nodes, and we will have supervision edges. In our case, label, uh, edges labeled with one when the edge exists in the graph, and edges labeled with zero in the case the uh, edge does not exist in the graph. The data set contains only one graph in the transductive learning scenario, which means that all message passing edges will be observed during training, testing, and validation, and we split only the supervision edges into train, test, and validation sets. Let's take, for example, this graph. In this graph, we have with black the message passing edges. This will remain fixed during training, testing, and validation. And all those nodes that share these edges will pass between them uh, node embeddings. The rest of the edges will be labeled with one, and they are going to be the positive edges. And also, we will need to construct some negative edges, which we label with zero. Because usually the graph is sparse, we will have many more negative edges than positive edges. So for this reason, we will need to sample an equal number of negative edges with the positive edges, such that our data set will be balanced. The positive edges will go into the first term of the binary cross entropy loss function, and the negative edges will go into the second term. If we will look at our model architecture, we will see that the node embedding features, X, will go to two um, sage convolution rail, layers, which are followed by a ReLU activation function, and the final output will go to a decoder. Looking inside the Sage convolution layer, 
we can see that for each node embedding, HAK, we concatenated with the average of the neighborhood node embeddings. We multiply it with a linear projection matrix, WK plus one, and the final result will go to a activation function, which in our case is the ReLU function. This will represent the final uh, node embeddings. We do this twice for each uh, convolution layer, and the output will go to the decoder. Simply put it, the decoder does the following. It takes the embeddings of two nodes, and it does the pairwise product between the elements of the two vectors. The final vector prediction will go into the uh, last function, and uh, it bad propagates the error. If we, uh, the first layer of the model architecture will take the information from nodes that are at one hub distance. The second layer will take the information that are at, at two hub distance. If we want to take information in the graph from, let's say, two hub, three hub distance or four hub distance, we will need to add more layers to the network. But doing this will result in the problem of oversmoothing. Why is that? Because usually a uh, stage convolution layer takes the average of the neighborhood nodes, and doing this multiple times and updating the nodes with the average of the other no neighbor nodes will uh, res result in um, not being able to distinguish between the node embeddings because they will be too similar. And how can we overpass this problem? We will take the hidden state from the first Sage convolution layer, concatenate it with the hidden state from the second convolution layer, and pass the result to the decoder and that, uh, do the exact the same things as we did previously. As we can see in our uh, final results, we used a classical approach with a SVM model. We used also a base approach with a graph neural network Sage and we use an uh, improved approach with a graph neural network jumping knowledge stage. And looking at accuracy, we see that the best results are obtained using the jumping knowledge stage neural network. Uh, in another experiment, we try to fine tune a feed for our neural network on our data set, but we observed that it was very poor under trained. And that was because the total number of trainable parameter, parameters in the fit for our neural network was 525, more than 10 times uh, bigger than uh, in a graph neural network where you, we used 35,000 parameters. So we concluded that the graph neural networks are better fitted for small data sets. So, as conclusions. Uh, we created a graph from companies and trained a graph neural network to predict relationships between companies with 67% uh, accuracy. We increased the performance by adding information from different neighbors' ranges and obtained an accuracy of 71%. And we plan to improve the model by adding Laplacian eigenvectors as positional encoding for graph neural networks. Thank you. Uh, next is my colleague, Armen. Uh, thank you, Mihai. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Armen Inans. I'm a senior AI ML research engineer at Morningstar. And uh, I will present one more project that we've done using graph data. So we've built a graph neural network that was trained to predict ESG uh, indicator scores for companies. So what is this all about? ESG is a system for assessing sustainability of companies based on three categories, environmental, social, and governance. Each of these categories have subcategories and each of, uh, called indicators, and each of those subcategories consist of binary uh, parameters, which we call tick boxes. So the problem of, of uh, computing or predicting the score of indicators, it boils down to a simpler problem of predicting the value of a tick box for a company. So, for example, in the environmental category, we have uh, an indicator 
for environmental policy, and one of the factors that affects this indicator is the commitment of a company to uh, implement environmental protection. Uh, another example in the social axis, we have discrimination policy indicator, and one of the tick boxes that corresponds to this indicator is commitment to ensure equal opportunity. So how do we decide what should be the value of a tick box for a company? We do this based on the company's disclosed documents. Uh, and last year, my colleagues, and they're present here, uh, presented a project called DBP, in which they automate this process uh, using NLP techniques. Uh, but then we uh, put to, uh, to ourselves a different problem, a similar one, but uh, slightly different. We want to predict uh, the values of tick boxes for companies based on the data that we collected over years about companies, uh, information about them, and, and the tick boxes that correspond to them. And we want to explore this uh, knowledge graph uh, and to see if we can find some patterns and predict uh, the values of tick boxes and thus indicator scores with high accuracy. So our database consists of four kinds of entities. Companies, tick boxes, countries, and sub-industries. We put these entities into a graph. They're represented as nodes. We connect a company with a tick box node if the tick box has a true value for that company. We connect a company with a country it's incorporated in and with uh, industries it belongs to. So we obtain a, a graph with different kinds of uh, nodes and different kinds of edges. Here, the edges actually have different semantics. They look similar, but they have different meaning. These structures are also known in literature as heterogeneous information networks or, or simply heterogeneous graphs. The graph that we built has over uh, 5,000 nodes and over 13,000 edges. So how do we process this graph to be used with neural networks? First, we have to compute the node embedding vectors for each node. And we use Google's universal sentence encoder to convert company descriptions, tick box descriptions, country names, and sub-industry names into vectors. So then to train uh, a network using this graph, we use a different paradigm. Uh, Mihai presented a few minutes ago the transductive scenario in which we use the same graph to train, to validate, and to test, just masking some of its parts. Here we used a different scenario, it's called inductive, in which we first split the graph into disjoint parts. We split into 30, the number can, be, can vary. And then we put those disjoint parts, uh, subgraphs, into train, validation, and test data sets. So the validation and test parts of the graph are not observed by the model while it's trained. Further on, we have to, again, split the edges into message passing and supervision edges. The supervision edges are chosen only between the edges that connect companies and tick boxes. So we make half of them supervision edges and use the other half for message passing. And we also have to sample negative supervision edges which will help label zero uh, for training uh, the model and building the loss function. And again, we uh, sample them with the same quantity as the positive supervision edges. Now let's have a look at the model's architecture. The first layer of the model is the heterogeneous variant of the graph sage model that Mihai presented in the previous project. Uh, it is designed for heterogeneous graphs, graphs that have different kinds of nodes and edges. This model distinguishes between message types. So here's the, the key difference. It has its own convolution layer for each message type, and then these layers are aggregated and combined. And I, I'll, I'll talk ab about it more uh, later. The next step is building edge features. We concatenate source node and target node features together, and then we pass these vectors to a multi-layer perceptron and obtain the prediction. So the model that we built has around 1.4 million parameters. How do we combine information coming from different types of node, of messages? 
Uh, this is really important because there are different ways of combining. We can just take the mean, the sum, etc. But we used a uh, semantic attention mechanism introduced in 2019 in Heterogeneous Attention Network paper. Uh, this allows us to learn embedding functions for each of the message type. So, in a way to learn the semantics and the, the impact of each of the message type for predicting uh, the values of tick boxes. Uh, for training, we use the same loss function, binary cross entropy. Some technical details, we, lose, we use uh, a learning rate scheduler, early stopping, and as a performance measure, we use AUC ROC, which is a uh, threshold agnostic measure of how well perform a model performs, a binary classifier performs. And finally, we uh, selected a threshold so that the true positive rate and the true negative rate is equal, and we obtain 80% of accuracy on the test set. So summing up, we're really satisfied with the results. We were able to use the, the past knowledge and the data that we built about companies in order to predict with 80% of accuracy uh, the values uh, of, of tick boxes um, using the knowledge graph made of companies, tick boxes, countries, and sub-industries. The model that we built fe features semantic level attention, and it helps us to identify which types of relations were the most important for predicting those values. And as part of future work, we plan to augment this knowledge graph with additional information, as this structure is really flexible. It allows to add relations that have different semantics. And we hope to increase accuracy by doing so. And also, we plan to experiment with other models for heterogeneous graphs, such as models that have hierarchical attention layers. So that's all we had for today. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take your questions. We haven't deployed this model yet, so it's still at the research phase. Uh, but we're planning to integrate with predictors that we built earlier to facilitate the work of analysts, basically. Okay. Because at the end, the decisions are made by analysts, and we're building tools to help them. The questions are coming from this part. <laughs> Uh, so the idea would be that based on the inductive uh, model, mm -hmm. uh, the analysts would uh, try to assume like uh, looking at company A, it uh, has those ticks marked, so it's probable that in the near future it's going to uh, announce a new uh, greener policy or something like that, so they know uh, maybe they should invest ahead of time before the news hit the market. That would be the way this model would be used in practice? Or? Well, this model, it just uh, indicates the likelihood based on the company's profile. Like companies, similar companies are likely to have this uh, image. Yeah, but a, then it's... A, a product that it would use it, yeah, not, not the model itself. Yeah. Pardon me? A, a product that would use this, not, not the model itself. But yeah, so mm. th this would be like the, the intuition that you aim for, to provide, right? So probably it's a question to <laughs> Arik is better to, to answer this. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your question. I think uh, I'll just uh, repeat it so that I confirm that I've gotten it correctly. So the question is whether the product or the solution based on this knowledge graph will have a predictive value for the analyst. So the analyst would like uh, look into the prediction and wait for that to become a reality. Is that the question? Based on the prediction, he would say, okay, uh, with the likelihood of 80%, they might go greener next year, so I'm going to invest now in the hopes that they will launch the news and profit. Perfect. Thank you very much. So our use case, basically we are a research house. So what our analysts do, they are not like necessarily the investment house analysts who uh, look at research and industry or a company or an equity stock, and then they do the investment or divestment. No, we generate ratings that are our final products, and our ratings are then being used by our clients, which are the asset owners and asset managers, who in their turn uh, incorporate them into their decision making. But uh, your question is very good, so let me just elaborate on that. 
Our goal is to create uh, machine learning and AI-powered tools for sustainability analysts to be able not only to cover more in the set you know, amount of time that they have, but also we're kind of in a way changing the nature of an analyst work. If a decade ago, our analysts would be going through corporate disclosure line by line and coming up with the tick box assessments or indicator assessments that my colleagues have just mentioned. Now, in a way, our analysts are starting to act more as quality assurance people who go through the, or that's the expectation, and we're gradually moving in that direction, who are going through the outputs of the uh, smart technology solutions of the machines. They do some random systematic checking. They go through the corner cases. But in reality, they're more just go, going through the quality, and then they're making sure that the predictions of machine are meaningful, and we can take those as, uh, as the basis for our ratings. We do have very robust quality assurance measures also automated. So, you know, if a company that's been an outlier an, in a negative sense of the word, so that's been involved in a lot of controversies, suddenly automatically shows a huge improvement, we'll go and check, because the likelihood of this kind of um, improvement is low, and the opposite also uh, applies. But in general, what our mantra is that in the, I'll use a very old phrase from 1960 article published in MIT review by John Licklider, that's called the man-computer symbiosis. And the main argument of this article, I think, still persists, that the business context defines the degree to which a human interacts with the machine and which decisions are taken by the machine, which decisions are taken by the human. In our case, uh, on the highest level, I would say the following. We're trying and we're automating almost any complex process that previously was done by the humans. When it comes to an uncertainty, and machines are, uh, are good with when they cope with complexity, but when it comes to uncertainty, when it comes to polysemanticity, machines have their challenges. When it comes to decisions and their outputs that are made based, uh, that uh, imply a certain level of uncertainty, there is where our analysts come into the play, go through the uh, output of the machine, and their both positive and negative feedback feeds back into the machine. So that's our mantra. That's the, that's the business uh, context of, uh, of the use of those models. Have I answered your question? Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, any other questions? Oh, you do, please. Thank you. Uh, really nice presentation. I, I, I've seen in there a metric, accuracy, accuracy KPI. I'm just curious, how exactly do you compute this? How do you measure the accuracy of the model? Oh, we just take a ratio of uh, right predictions to all predictions. So it's simple, simple computation. Do you mean Wait. also the process? So was the gold yeah. standard? Yeah, yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it, I went out. Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, it works. So, uh, could you please repeat the question? How do you measure the accuracy uh, reported to the golden st the standards that you have? Uh, reported to the golden standards. Yeah. Oh, okay. For regarding the golden standards uh, of industry, I think. So, in, a, in general, our approach is the following. So, the projects, the two projects you saw today are, uh, are in very much in a, I don't know which term would be right, Skunkworks or R&D stage, they are in the R&D stage. During the R&D stage, what we do, we usually uh, run our predictions based on data that's available for us. We backtest a lot. So, for corporate performance, we have plethora of data going back by, I don't know, a couple of decades, actually, really. It depends on the depth of data, of course. At this stage, this is what we take as the gold standard. We basically backtest the predictions of the models for, let's say, the f past year or something. We, we don't want to go more than that because, you know, the business context changes. So we want to be as adequate as possible. When in the production mode, the approach is a bit different. So what we do, we have uh, quality assurance measures whereby by random systematic check, our analysts actually check the outputs of the model, regardless whether these are corner cases or outliers already detected by the machine. 
and this serves as partial gold standard. I think here, you know, when I think a lot about this, you know, you can never be sure that you have the right gold standard because the price of having that means that you don't, you don't automate anything. So I'll refer to the previous uh, presentation in the other hall. Here we deal with a lot of you know, unknown knowns, for example, right? And that's how we do that. It's very much inductive. There are probably some mistakes. By now, we've been good in detecting them and making sure that they get back feedback into our training set. Have I answered your question? You, yes. Perfect. So, ladies and gentlemen, any other questions? I think we still have a couple more minutes. Oh, there's a gentleman in the back. Hello. Uh, I'm curious, how much uh, data did you use for training, uh, validation, and uh, testing? You want to take this one? Um, in our project with uh, company predictions, we, uh, incident company prediction, we used a uh, uh, couple of hundreds data uh, companies uh, with description, and from those companies we created a graph. Uh, it had uh, 527 nodes and 637 edges. And all, all those companies, all those nodes, had a text desc description, which was used as uh, word embeddings with uh, 512 dimension. And that was the, the data set. I mean, it, it, it was not big. Yes, but how did you party the data into training, validation, and test? Uh, I split it into 60% uh, train, 35% uh, test, and 0.5% uh, uh, validation. Thanks. How long did the, the training took? Uh, the training was pretty fast. I mean, it was not... Uh, uh, we used the PyTorch, and it has some um, uh, optimization from sparse matrix multiplication. It was very fast. Uh, on GPU, some kind of, I don't know, a couple of minutes. Yeah, fast. Thank you.